What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Surf and Sales podcast. This is going to be our acid trip version of a podcast where you <laughs> cannot resist. You just have to go with it. For anybody who has never been here before, if you're appearing as a guest, a lot of guests are like, what are we going to talk about? Where are we going to go? Where are we going to take this? And Richard and I do not know. We never know. We don't plan it. It's kind of like an acid trip. You just got to go with the flow and see what happens. I'm one of your two co-hosts. I'm Scott Lees, co-founder of the Surf and Sales Summit and the Surf and Sales Podcast here with my good friend and partner, Richard Harris. How's it going, big guy? It's going good. I Just for the record, I've never done acid. So Scott, I could do a whole episode with you if you've ever done it. Not to say that you have to admit it now and just ask you what it's like. That would be a fascinating uh, conversation. So, But you can just say no comment. I'm going to say no comment, but I, I'm going to wonder what the vote would be from all the listeners who thinks that scott has done acid before and who does not that's what i want to know that might be the title of this episode much much to our (laughs) guest yeah our our guest who we'll introduce here just a second his name is carlos noche he's a partner over at visualize he's got a value selling background and frameworks about value selling and we might get into what the heck value selling and the methodology is and what it all means and is it any good and should you use it? But before that, Richard's going to tell us about our wonderful sponsor, HubSpot. Yes, who, by the way, has no comment or endorsement of any drug use, both legal or illegal. So let's get that clear. Uh, I'm going to start at the end, which is, hey, you know, uh, with Sales Hub from HubSpot closing deals is it's really no big deal. You can try it for yourself at HubSpot.com slash sales, HubSpot.com slash sales. However, here's what you need to know about the sales hub. So one, uh, it's got totally new prospecting workspace to make connections with everybody a whole lot easier. It's got deal management, which, you know, we all sort of have to work through on a regular basis. And, you know, because it is important and it's one of the most important things as we go forward, whether you like it or not. It's got an AI assistant to help you get rid of all the busy work so you can actually spend time doing the things you really need to be doing to close your revenue. So please check out our friends at HubSpot.com slash sales. All right, Scott, what are we going to talk about now that's possibly legal or illegal? I don't know, but what we're going to do is introduce Carlos Noche. Welcome to the show, my man. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, over 500 episodes. I'm happy to be part of the journey. Yeah, thanks. I, I can't believe that we've spent so much time talking to each other, Richard. Yeah, I know. So that's... I mean, it's like 500 hours of conversation that we've been a part of. Yeah. As vacation together or anything fun like that? Well, we we used to, but now we, now we don't because we're probably sick of each other. <laughs> but that's not true too. We also have the Surf and Sales events, which Carlos, you should come to at the end of November. So you should I do we do we have we've got a couple tickets left i think we have five tickets left four or five i can't remember at this point yeah i'm check it out at surfandsales.com carlos tell everybody what is visualized and what you do there and give everybody a little bit of a quick snippet on your background for context so visualize is a group of partners that we put ourselves together to represent this value selling framework It's owned by Value Selling Associates, and it's a sales methodology, which I know half the audience just went, "Eh," and the other half went, "Eh, maybe. And uh, me and my partners, I've been doing this for 15 years. I I switched over to this side of the equation, and I've gotten to work with all sorts of companies around the globe in different industries, which is the part I like. You know, it keeps me on my toes. I keep to learn new value props, new challenges, dealing with multiple generations of salespeople, and trying to motivate them to make a positive change. I like that part though, where you said it's kind of like people go, huh, or, hmm. Cause I kind of feel like that's the response Scott and I get to, you know, people. They're like, oh, okay. And then others are like, oh, okay. So, um, so well, talk to us sorry, about, you- Carlos, your, what's your definition of value selling as a, as a, methodology specifically and why value selling? Maybe that's the first question. Why Why do you like that one? Or is it just what you grew up with? So you guys have some vast sales experience. Have you guys been through some sales training before? And if so, how many? Well, it's what I do for a living. So yes. Uh, yes but did you did you suffer through any as a sales rep? Of course. For sales leader. Yeah. 
Of course. What was it? Mine were never, so let, let me be frank. Mine were never that suffering because I never, I was never the person who went from company to company to company because I was always at small companies where nobody invested in this, right? So, um, okay. So you, so you never went through them. Right. So I'm self-taught of the different methodologies yeah. before I came up with mine. Yeah. That I'm in the same boat actually, Carlos. All right. I never worked someplace that brought in, uh, really an external, um, sales trainer. The closest thing would be my friend, Mike Lindstrom, uh, out of Arizona, who was an investor in one of the companies who came and talked to us, um, once or twice, twice a year. That would be the closest. So I, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, I didn't work for huge companies, but I, at least I, I, I worked for the companies that did invest in a sales methodology, a training, a framework, something that, hey, we need to elevate our game and we need to be speaking the same language. And the uh, first one I took was solution selling. And along the way, I think I counted them once, it was 11 different types of programs. And Richard, to go back to your question, well, what's value selling? Well, value selling is one that I got in the middle there somewhere. And it really just had a little bit of a 360 degree perspective. Same stuff. We're trying to get to power. We're trying to understand why they're making a decision, why they're making it now. And we're trying to position why they would do it with us. However, it took an approach that was really about them versus us running a sales campaign. Let's face it. No one ever wants to be sold, but we all love to buy. So how do you work with someone to connect to the reasons why they would buy? how they would even represent it to their boss and their boss's boss to do something. And this value selling framework at the heart of it, folks, is it's simple because I'm not that complex. <laughs> I could explain it on a napkin in a bar in Mexico City with a partner. And to me, that worked. It worked for me. So my career progressed and I eventually became a you know a director and a worldwide VP. And then thirdly, I, I could actually share it with my own team, right? Because the hardest thing of having any common language is y'all got to be speaking it. That means you and your team need to be discussing the key components and all agreeing on what they are. And with its simplicity came its effectiveness. It was simple enough to do this, not only with the reps, but the customers and customer success and marketing and services to get us all on the same page to accomplish a goal, which is a result for our customers. Have you noticed any sort of change in the overall receptiveness to the concept of value selling over the course of the last, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years? I'm wondering if it's skewing one way or the other. Um, do things change? Hell yeah. Just kind of like my hero line. Uh, things are constantly changing. Perception-wise, I think we've been really successful because if you think about the success of the SaaS model, for example. It's not about just getting a transaction or order. It's about accomplishing an outcome so they will renew and buy more and continue that journey. And that we've been riding that wave successfully. And Scott, have things changed? You know, we got different generations. In fact, someone told me we got more generations in sales today, in business today than ever before. So you're dealing with folks from baby boomers to Gen Zers with different perspective on what is appropriate or right or wrong. So that's an effect or a change on this. Uh, buyers have changed, right? We've been all been optimized to the nth degree. Budgets are tight with the current economy. So, hey, we need to get back to some of the basics where money is not cheap anymore. That's also changed. But at the heart of it, the reason I think we've survived is because we're really about aligning to someone's buying process. Do they have an overriding you know, reason to make a change and make it now? Can we understand their perspective of the problem, their current state? Can we understand what they're looking for and affect it in a way that we can differentiate ourselves? And then three more little questions. Even if it, there's a problem they should do something, is it worth it? That's where the value piece come in. Who needs to get involved? Because it's a complex organization. Gartner says it's like, 7.2 people per decision these days. So you need there's multiple people involved. And then lastly, can we document this or outline this in a way where the customer's actually convinced they're actually going to get that outcome? And by documented, I don't mean a project plan or quote. I mean like, hey, here's the things that have happened so far. Here's what when you make a decision and here are the key milestones to get to the outcome that you ultimately wanted to do 
on this date, on this timing. I got. I want to go back to one thing you said that you know things have changed. You know, and one of the things you talked about budgets are tight and all that. Do you really think that's changed? Is it really any different? Because I don't think that's changed very much. I think people may not be willing to spend as much, but that's no different than any other time, right? There, what's changed more is around the decision making process around it than, you know, just sort of this concept that the budget has changed or budgets are tight. Because, you know, even two years ago, people always still want a discount, right? So I'm, I'm trying to understand, do you really think it's changed or is it, you know, wash, rinse, repeat? So Richard, let me agree and disagree a second. For one thing, uh, I got the same hairline. So we've been around a block and the reality is things ebb and flow all the time, right? We have times where the market's great. People buy more transactions. Things are a little bit more easygoing. There are times money's tight. So for example, you know, during COVID and people didn't know what was going on, money became tighter. People were more, they were going through layoffs. It was harder to get a deal through an organization because organizations were more cautious, but it ebbs and flows all the time. And what I mean by change today is not just that, hey, I want a discount. It's that, hey, uh, BC just told me I I, money is not cheap and it's not coming and I got to make do with what I got for the next two to three years or, hey, I, I got to, you know, they've changed this whole thing on me. It's not about growth, growth, growth. Now they actually want to see a profit within a certain time frame. So I'm going to be more selective on where I'm spending my money and making my bets. So and, they've just become more educated. Yeah. But you could go, again, that's why I said I could agree with it. Well, Carlos, that's that's happened over and over and over again through the years. It has. Yeah. Um, right. No disagreement there. And now can you adapt your sales process and what you're looking for in a way that you're looking for those things? And I think reps that had a process going into this and by a process, Hey, a simple checklist, make sure they're covering the basis, make sure they understand the customer going into the deal. They're, they're still successful today. We're still successful today because we're all hundred percent quota carrying sales reps. We're not just sitting back waiting for training to come down the line. Hey, we're trying to find new prospects, work those accounts, become a priority, close them, and then manage those accounts. This is part of the intellectual acid trip theme of this particular episode. So as we, what's changed, nothing's changed. Well, yes, these things have changed, right? Um, <laughs> yes, right. There's <laughs> a ton of full inception. What changed? Nothing. Well, except for these things. So everything has basically changed. Yes, it has. Yes. So you love all this tactical stuff though, Richard. Yeah, I do. I do. I have, a, I have another question for Carlos, uh, which is, and I never thought about it. I, I, think I, I think I agree with you. There's never been this many generations in sales as there are now. How is that beneficial and how is that harmful? What makes it good? What makes it bad? As far as beneficial, I enjoy the, the, you know, the exchange of information. I I like learning from new people, whether they're older than I am or younger than my than I am. And unfortunately, I'm starting to see more people that are younger, uh, in getting perspective. So I I think you know having multiple generations in there and having different perspectives is not a bad thing. What makes it difficult is as you're trying to reach them, you need to adapt. You as the whoever the speaker is need to make sure you adapt to that persona and their perspective to make that connection. Hey, I'm a Gen Xer, at least that's what they call me. You know, you, you told me climb that hill, do that, and we pay you, we'd go do it. Now, the millennials and Gen Z are like, but, but why? Getting paid is not enough. So you gotta be able to adapt. And you could, you could argue the same thing in sales. As we're in, as you look at your customers, there are multiple generations that you're dealing with. How do you change how you engage with someone? Because you can't just show up and throw up about your product and expect that it's all going to work out to meet you know their generation and their perspective. Richard, does that answer your question? You got that it, look on your face. No, it does. It does. I was sending a note over to Scott to <laughs> make sure he wasn't tripping too hard. I've I, I've put I've closed the door and I'm in a safe zone, so I feel ready for this. He's ready. 
So you grew up uh, in New York. You said you're from a New Yorker. You said you're a New Yorker earlier. What what part of New York? Uh, I was born in lovely up and coming Jamaica, New York. Right. And if you're wondering, yes, it's not up and coming, but that's where I was born. My parents immigrated here. I was born a year later. And then uh, we were like the Jeffersons moving uptown to Queens Village. That was lovely. And uh, and then I went to high school and college in Florida. And then I went to Chicago, Bay Area, where you're at, Richard. And then finally, I ended up in the lovely state of Georgia. So you've been all, all over the place. My question was going to be about how geography plays a part in sales and sales uh, approach and tactic and mindset because i have not lived all over those places but i have had offices all over those places and worked with people from all of those places and i'm wondering if you have seen different pockets different styles mm -hmm. in each of these different places and and how that has played a part in how you go about coaching different folks so first off uh even if you just think about across the U.S. and the different personalities and backgrounds, that's one, let's say, perspective. But then as I look across the globe, like going over to Europe and going to Asia, going to Latin America, uh, I'm from Spanish descent, so you, you think about Latin America, they'll all tell you, hey, we all speak differently. We all have different perspectives, you know, so that different Scott is everywhere. So when you think about the sales framework, it's got to be more than just tactics in style or you know like i was having this conversation with a team out of europe and this person from the netherlands said carlos uh that's way new york direct we would never ask a question that way i go great how would you get to that same outcome she goes well we would ask it in this way about the team or about the goals of the team versus the individual because that would uh be more uh, authentic and real in our culture. I go, fantastic. This class isn't about you using my words. This class is about, we need this piece of information and we need it so we can qualify the deal, work the deal, close the deal and drive to a successful outcome. And they need it so they can make a purchasing decision. So Scott, going back to your question, I, the, I'm not trying to change people's styles. I'm not trying to create Latin New Yorkers across the globe. I'm trying to get people to be curious about their buyers and help their buyers make a buying decision. And here's some key components and a checklist to get there. How you get there, let me help you. Let's come out and figure out something that works with your style. So do you hire, if you're a hiring manager, you're built, I mean, you used to be a sales leader. So if you're building a team and you sell to one particular type of buyer, this particular product, are you, are you trying to skew your hiring towards people who are from a particular area and already have this style that you think matches that sale versus hiring somebody else that I have to kind of adjust how they approach things a little bit? God, I mean, that's a, a tough question without knowing more details, but I've had this conversation because I also invested in, in other businesses. Well, let, 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 let me try to simplify okay. it for you. Let's say, let's say you have two candidates in front of you, me and Richard in front of you, okay? And oh, boy. You're, you're selling a um, an, a piece of enterprise software, all right? It's a six to 12 month sales cycle. It's a $100,000 plus price point based on what you know about personality type only and approach and style, which one of those personality types, Richard from Georgia, Scott from California, is better suited? Or is that a ridiculous assumption to be part of the decision-making process? No, I think it's important. I mean, you might have all the skill set, but you don't really match with the crowd and audience that you're selling to. And I think that's an important part of putting the right people in the right roles to be successful. And it's funny you mention this because I have a, a one of my neighbors is a retired executive from Honda, and you know after a couple of bourbons we sometimes have these conversations, and uh, and it's like you know, you know they have the same background, they meet the requirements. I go well, but you gotta maybe this is a bias, but I think I want to put someone in a role where I think their personality, their background their knowledge is going to make them successful. 
And if I'm not, I'm doing them a disservice. I'm putting them in a position where they have a bigger mountain to climb to go figure that out. And I might do that if, if I still think they're my best candidate I have, but I, I like to really match the people that I'm kind of, that I'm hiring for the roles. And I take the customer into that equation. And I think everybody should take the customer to the equation. What is a customer expecting from us? There it is, Scott. No, that was the that was the moment we've all been waiting for. Is it bad? Good? Richard was on mute. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I've got a uh we gotta do a, a quick little mid-roll for our sponsor, but um the other piece I was gonna sort of come back to you with was what was I gonna come back to you? Uh oh, looks like it was good. It was good. Yeah. Well you lost it was it. genius. I lost it. Uh, I'll figure it out while I do this mid roll real quick. Um, oh, it's about, oh, I want to hear your thoughts around the SDR function, where it's okay. going, what's it going to be, all that kind of stuff. So, but quickly, um, you know, if you didn't know what separates the contenders from the pretenders, it's pretty simple. It's the fourth quarter and we are there. It's October, 2023. And yes, the pressure is on. It's coming. It's been coming all year. And now it's really, really going to hit. So if you really want to win in Q4, you really should be taking a look at the HubSpot sales hub. It's got everything your team needs uh, to end strong from new prospecting workspace to deal management tools, smart sequences, all in one place. So spend more of your Q4 time closing deals than ever to crush and hit your targets with sales hub. Learn more about it at HubSpot.com slash sales. And again, my favorite short URL they've ever given us. So thank you. HubSpot.com slash sales. Carlos. What's going to happen to the SDR role? How soon does it evaporate? It's funny you ask that because that was a question on the podcast that someone else brought up. You know, it's with funding being tougher and people expecting reps to prospect more. Well, let's take a little, let's go back on the old time machine. Do you all remember a time where reps, AEs, account executives were expected to prospect and it was part of their job? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Of course. And then that's where we grew up, right? And then we got this, let's call it, you know, what do they call it? SDRs, BDRs, we'll call it XDRs, you know, became a part of this thing. We had a lot of funding and we kind of grew out that function. And it's a great function. In fact, I work with a lot of young XDR teams and their leadership. In fact, that's when I'm doing a rollout next week. So to your core of your question, do I think the XDR role is dead? No. Uh, these companies are, need pipeline to get there. Now, wh- how they get the pipeline, what I am seeing, Richard, is, hey, I want to see so much pipeline, real qualified pipeline, not just get me a meeting with a human coming from my XDRs, and I want to see my reps going back to pain and goal and prospecting as well because they got to self-generate. Yeah, that, I get that. Like that. That's what's been happening, I would say, for the last... 18 months to two years, like we're sort of getting back to the full cycle rep a little bit because yep. it generates more pipeline in general. But I'm I'm talking about what happens, what happens two years from now, three years from now with AI and all this stuff. Is the SDR role going to go away? Is it going to shift and have a completely different role and responsibility? What do you think? I don't know if it's going to be as big because uh, we've been looking at all these different AI tools within our own prospecting program and how they help. But the reality is you still need someone to go manage these things to do it effectively. How many emails do you guys get bombarded with that make absolutely no sense? No, I, I mean, I get that. <laughs> I, I think my question is, so that means the role evolves. You, the SDR is not writing and crafting the message. They're just making sure the machine's sending the right message. Yeah, but hey, today, the, very few of them are great at, remember, you set up these email campaigns and outreach and sales off and everything else. So that takes a little bit off their plate. Then you're asking them to customize it a little bit. Now they just have better tools in these AI tools coming down the the stack to really customize that message a little bit better. And hopefully we're using some of this also to be more targeted on who we're going after. But do I see AI taking over the SDR role? I don't. Um, You know, maybe for some lower end organizations, you can just get it churning out there and reaching out. But do I see the role being dead? My opinion and... Heck, what do I know? I'm just this Latin kid from New York City. I, I don't see it dying tomorrow or in two years. What about five years? 
you know, I don't even know if I'm around in five years. So who knows? But uh, you're making, we're, we're making this assumption. There's this great fear that AI is taking over everything. And the reality is, you know, I, I don't know if we're there yet. I see it as a great co-pilot. The things we've done with AI are amazing. And every day someone sends me something else. I go, you did that with AI? Yeah, it took me like two seconds. So I'm amazed at where it's going. Does that mean that, you know, hey, we're just going to automate some functions for outreach and eliminate, um, you know, AI is not picking up the phone and tracking you boys down over and over again to try to have a call. Not yet. Not yet, but it can. <laughs> and then when you pick up the phone... I, again, my two cents. When you pick up the phone, how how you weren't excited to talk to Bob from India. How excited are you going to be to talk to the AI? It depends what it sounds like, and depends how good it is. It does, and we'll see where, how where we and get to. And, that, and that's why right now it's a co-pilot, rather yep. than yeah, rather than the driver. But when that. AI makes a phone call that is indistinguishable from a human in terms of cadence and tone, ability to read emotion and sentiment and have empathy and negotiate. And it's a fraction of the cost and it's a commoditized race to the bottom. I don't see how the human being SDR survives. Survives it all. When what about the ends? I don't know. What about the rep? I don't know when that's gonna happen. It's one year, ten years, fifty years. I don't know. Yeah. But if you're asking me, do I think that a human being in an SCR seat will live forever? I think the answer is no. It's a really tough job. And if we can automate it, I like the idea, Scott. And I don't know, you know, maybe in five years it really diminishes. But going along your thinking, Scott, what about the rep? Yeah, I think the rep comes after. I think the SCR function goes away first. And the AE function will take longer to go away. But I think that one's in trouble potentially as well. I do. I don't I have yet to hear a compelling argument that keeps the human being superior than an AI that is uh getting smarter, stronger, faster, whatever, at speeds with which we can barely comprehend. I read the other day that in like five or six years from now, the AI's uh, capability will be 128 times more powerful than it is right now today. We can't fathom what 128 times more powerful means. I agree. And if you're talking about a world in 10 years, 15 years where Richard's kids and my kids are executives. You think people answer cold calls in 10, 15 years? Have you, have you taught, do you have, you have kids or you have grandkids or whatever? Have you, go ask them when the last time they used the telephone was. Yeah. They don't, they don't know. I, that's my thing. So I, I think it's in trouble. I just don't know when that moment is where it will no longer be uh, effective. But I think that there is an mm -hmm. end date. So, so which is, going, scary, which is very scary, yeah. which is why most people push back really hard and say, you know, fuck you, Scott, like you're wrong. You're an idiot. Da, 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 da. Because it's scary because your livelihood is threatened. So it's like, it's like a, is threatened. it sounds like it's a really bad acid trip. Well, so, so. someone gets to program those AIs. So for the cream of the prom. Yeah. We might still have some of us in there, but the AIs are programming now. <laughs> yeah, you can take a picture of a whiteboard, a storyboard uh, of, a, of a website and whatnot, put it in front of the AI right now, and it will spit the code out and bang. Yeah, it's so right now you need a human to program it. But what happens when you don't need a human? To program human. It? So, so the thing will come down to: for what you're selling, is human interaction really required? Because if you're talking about something that's transactional. That's going to go first. Uh, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm buying, uh, so I'm going to take care of my HVAC or I'm buying some piece of software, happened. which I know where it is. That's going to go first, right? That's the easier That's stuff. That's Amazon. That's already But when you get to the more complex sale, that's when you start talking about, hey, how are we going to manage that? Does it matter? Is it human interaction really going to matter? I also think too, though, that 
you know, and we never talk about this in sales is what are the buyers doing with AI? How are buyers doing this, right? So if I'm a CTO, right, and I need to implement some security system or some new security protocol or whatever, you know, what's out there in AI to help my team do that? And can, you know, sadly that person be replaced so that at some point it's the APIs of the AIs working together to solve this problem, right? So, you know, we always talk about it from the seller side. We never talk about it from the buyer side. And so that's a big piece of like, well, what did our buyers experience? You know, to your point about value selling and the thing I teach is that, you know, there, there's no buyer's journey. There's just a buyer's experience. And what do we do to improve that experience? And so I think that's the piece that's still overlooked right now, at least at least by us, because we're also worried about ourselves and, and our jobs. So it'll be interesting because I think those tech roles, you know, if I were if I were a programmer, if I was Scott's brother, I, I, you know, a programmer, you know, that to me feels like, oh, shit, when am I going to get replaced? You know, um, and then once they're replaced and we're replaced, then it's all just AIs. Right. Um, you know, who knows what we're going to do. So. This, this uh, asset trip has gone at a low. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, I think it's important for people to face the possibilities, both good and bad. Yeah. So they have awareness and think this, how can you safeguard yourself as best as possible? and uh, optimize your skills and optimize your earning potential and optimize your network and make yourself continue to be relevant and important as possible for as long as possible. I think that that is a superior strategy to uh, toxic positivity and sticking my head in the sand like an ostrich and pretending like something bad may never happen. So that's why we like to engage in the, the thought experiment yeah. behind all this, right? Yeah. We're getting towards the end of the show, Carlos. This is the part where we say, how can we be helpful to you? Do you have any questions you want to ask us? Uh, so one little comment on that AI thing, just for the short term for our listeners, for your listeners. Hey, uh, I, I agree with you. Don't stick your head in the sand. Embrace it. Use it to the best you can to be more effective at your current function. Yep. You, you can't control whether it takes your job away, five, 10, 15 years ago, but you can control having a growth mindset today to take advantage of what's around you without avoiding it, right? It's, you know, that's the mentality going into it. And for you folks, um, 500 episodes, what, what makes them great? You know, what, what, what makes people listen to you guys? I, you know, we run our own little podcast ourselves and I'm looking for little tips from you guys on, you know, what gives people content that they find insightful and thought provoking to want to listen to you to wonderful med every day? It's a great question. If, and what if we, if we did some research, we might have an answer for that answer. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great question. And one that Richard and I, uh, have discussed and sort of end on, um, I have no idea why anybody pays attention to us. Yeah. That's usually where we end up. The feedback that we get though, in all seriousness, um, is we, I've heard a number of things. I've, I've heard that we keep things pretty raw and, and not formulaic. Uh, sometimes we push people outside of their comfort zones, even push each other outside of our comfort zones sometimes. And things get a little bit raw and, uh, I don't want to use the word heated, but just like, you know, we get real. Yeah. That's, yeah like impassioned, right? Um, and you know, we make people laugh a good amount, whether that's from making fun of each other or making fun of ourselves, making fun of the guests sometimes, uh, and, you know, things like that. And, and I think that there's a consistency element as well, which if you're doing a podcast of any kind, uh, or building a brand of any kind or shit, building pipeline, consistency is key. Yep. Like, oh, a lot of people start podcasts and release a few and then uh oh there's you know something happens and they take a few weeks off or turns into a few months and all that and i think we've done a really good job over the last four years of, of just continuously putting out content um really pretty religiously right so there's a good there's a good body of of work there 
And so I think people can rely on us, right? They're like, oh, I haven't, I, I want to listen to a sales podcast. Like, well, I know Scott and Richard will going to have, they'll have one episode, at, right? So that, that's what I think and, and what I've heard. Richard? I think that's it. I mean, I think, I mean, you talked about the humor. Um, people, people have always said they like the fact that we're like this old married couple and we just sort of bicker at each other. So I think that helps. Um, the fact that we keep it loose and it's very unstructured, right? Like he came in trying to say, well, what are we going to cover and what are we going to do? And we're like, I don't know. We'll just kind of go where it goes. Um, I think people like that. Um, I think they like the fact that there's, um, you know, a lot of people are like, well, there's so many episodes that it kind of doesn't matter. It's, it's not like a radio show where they feel like they have to listen every day or, um, or, or that, oh, they got to wait a week for the next one. There's always something like when we first did this, you know, and I think this, this was what people liked was that, you know, we did 200 episodes in the first year. Like it was crazy. Uh, wow. And, and that was by design. And I think that was a big important piece of this was that, you know, to Scott's point, we got passionate and people knew we were passionate and they were like, holy cow, these guys are, they're not fucking around. Like they're, they're going to do this. Um, and so I think that was a big, a, a big piece of it. And then we always have different guests and we have different topics and we've done everything from, you know, episodes about, you know, mental health and sales to, you know, value selling to, um, you know, we've talked about sports a lot and, and we actually had a guy who was on, uh, who was a, uh, professional NFL, he was an NFL player for a couple of years. Um, so had him on. So we try to keep it very different. And I think people like that too. That's not the same whole thing all the time. Appreciate it. I like it. Appreciate the time with us today, Carlos. Always uh, good to catch up. Good conversation, man. What is the best way for people to get in touch with you? Uh, see Noche on LinkedIn. Just look for N-O-U-C-H-E. There's not a lot of those out there. And uh, find me out on LinkedIn. Reach out. I'm, I'm a big believer. Rising tide rises all boats. If I can help someone, hey, it all comes around. Yep. Awesome. Totally. And if you're ever in North Georgia, because, you know, that's a, it's a big mecca of places to go. I actually know where he is. Scott, I went. Wait, Richard, is, is Macon in North? No, Macon's the very middle of the state. Where he is, is just the quick history is, is up north, getting closer to the mountains, where I went to summer camp, uh, you know, a nice little Jewish camp in this little place called White County that was a dry county. And the one time we got pulled over as counselors, it was fortunate that I was driving in my car with Georgia plates and Georgia license. And, you know, all my other friends are, you know, Solomon Rosenbaum and Rosenswag and I'm Richard Harris. So I think we got very lucky, um, in that regard. So, yes. So that's not where Carlos lives, by the way. So I'm not making a, a play on Carlos. I'm just talking about where I was. So I know the area you came for sales advice. Instead, you got a history of North Georgia, right? Just this little town sales podcast today. Everybody. Yeah. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Carlos. Thanks.